Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem partition array according to given pivot. Oh boy, am I excited to solve this very interesting problem today. The idea is we are given an input array of numbers and you know what, I'm just not even gonna bother with this explanation. I'll just run through the examples. So we're given an input array of nums. In this example, it could look like this. We're also given a parameter, which is the pivot. In this case, the pivot is 10. So what we want to do is partition the array. So we want the array to look something like this, where we have all the pivot values, however many there are. In this case, it looks like there's two occurrences of the pivot value. I don't think that's guaranteed. There could have been maybe none of them, or there could have been one of them, or maybe more than two. But either way, we want all of those right in the middle, or let's put it in the more general way. We want the pivot like this. And then we want the elements that are less than the pivot to be on the left side. And we want the values that are greater than the pivot to be on the right side. So when they say we're partitioning the array, it is actually a pretty straightforward partition. What about the relative order of these elements and these elements? Do they need to be in sorted order? No, because if we were doing that, well, we would just be sorting the array. We wouldn't be calling this a partition. So then can these elements be in any order? What exactly do we want? Well, the best way to show you is just to kind of go through this example. So I'll try to color code it. So the pivots are here and here. And I'm just gonna scan through this from left to right. I'm gonna circle all of the elements that are less than 10. So here we have nine, here we have five, here we have three. So the order that these elements are going to be placed here is gonna be the same order that they appear in the array, meaning this is one, this is two, this is three. Fantastic. Similarly, the elements that are greater than the pivot, I see one here and I see another one here. So one, two, they're gonna be placed in that same order on this side. So the output is going to be nine, five, and I think three, and then we're gonna have two tens, and then we're gonna have 12, and then we're gonna have 14. So these are the pivots, these are the values greater in the same relative order that they appear in the input, and these are the elements less. So how do we code this up? I mean, one very trivial way would just be to scan through the input, separate the elements into three different arrays. I'm pretty sure you know what the three different arrays are. One array for the elements less than, one array for the elements greater, and one array for the elements that are equal to the pivot. And then at the end, we just combine the arrays together. Could do that with a loop, could do that with some built-in functions or some other ways. Python has a very easy way to do this. So that's pretty much what we're gonna do. And the fact that we're using extra arrays means the space complexity is going to be linear as well as the time complexity. Let's code this up. So I'm gonna have an array for the elements that are less. I'm gonna have an array for the pivot elements. I'll call that P to not have like a name conflict with that. And then I'll have greater elements here. Then I just go through every number. I have a few if statements. Is it less than the pivot? If so, we do this. If it's uh, greater than the pivot, then we add it to the greater array. Otherwise, it must be equal to the pivot, in which case we add it to the pivot array. At the end, we can combine the two arrays. Python makes it easy for us. So this kind of follows like the drawing that I kind of had earlier, less plus P plus the greater array. So this is basically concatenating those three arrays together. And then we're returning that. I'll give this a run. You can see it works, it's pretty efficient. There is a way for us to solve this problem without having extra memory. Well, we are gonna need an array for the output. We actually can't do this in place. Your first thought might be like, can we do the partition in place? And it's not that we can't do a partition in place, it's that then we would not be able to preserve the relative order of elements. How do I know that? Because I have a pretty good understanding of DSA fundamentals. Let me show you what I mean. Quick sort, 
I have a lesson for it on a neat code IO. Very fundamental algorithm. It involves partitioning in a very similar way that we are doing in today's problem. And one thing about quicksort is that it is not a stable sorting algorithm. And that basically means that we do not preserve the relative order of elements as you know this states. So uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying you have to learn these fundamentals from Neat Code IO, but I definitely I think it's worth your time to have a very, very solid understanding of these fundamentals. I think Neat Code IO is a decent resource for that. And uh, I mean, there's some other courses as well that I think will definitely be worth your time, especially if you like Python, like all these uh, Python tips and tricks can be learned in this Python for Coding Interviews course, has a lot of interactive lessons and whatnot. Uh, but now to kind of solve this problem without using any additional space, it's going to be similar to what we did here. I guess one way to do it would be two pointers. So what I'm going to do is like based on how many elements we have in the input, I'm going to allocate an array like this one, like uh, of the same size. So I have the space for all of the elements. We could just fill it in with all zeros initially. And then I'm going to have two pointers. I could call them I and J. And so what those two pointers are going to do is it's going to start here and here. I'm basically going to iterate from left to right and right to left at the same time. You could consider this a single pass algorithm, but I mean, technically it's double passing. The fact that we combine it into a single loop doesn't really change the fact that we're iterating over the input twice. Uh, but anyways, what we're gonna do is from left to right, we're gonna fill in the values that are less than. So anytime I see a value from left to right, that's less than, so one, two, three, I'm gonna add those values here. A uh, boom, a uh, boom, and boom. So in terms of this array, we're also going to be keeping track of pointers. So I could call that, let's say, I2. That tells me like the insertion point. And then eventually that pointer is going to end up over here. And I'm going to have maybe J2 as well doing something similar. So anytime I see a number uh, that is bigger than 10. So as I iterate my J pointer from right to left, I'm going to see 14 and I'm going to see 12. And I'm going to add those like this, 14 and 12. So, okay, so then my J2 pointer will stop here. And so however much space is left here, in this case, there's gonna be two spaces. I'm then just gonna fill all of these in with the pivot element, which is 10. So 10 and 10. So nothing super fancy here. Knowing this, we can code this up with allocating only a single array. Okay, so I just initialized a few pointers. I and J are gonna be at the beginning and the end of the array. Same with I2 and J2. These are gonna tell us like the insertion positions of the result array here that we've declared and we've created it to be of the same size as the input array. That's what we are going to end up returning. And so then the first part can just be like this, while I is less than the input. Even though I have this as my condition, inside of the loop, we're actually gonna be manipulating both i and j. We just know that we only have to check one of these conditions. We just have to make sure this is less than that, or we could make sure that j is greater than or equal to zero. As long as one of those pointers is in bounds, we are good because we then know that the other pointer must also be in bounds because they're iterating over the exact same array, just in reverse order. Anyways, you'll see what I mean here. We're gonna check if the number at index i is less than the pivot, in which case, then we will say in the result, not at index i, but at i2, we're going to set this number, and then we will increment i2. Otherwise, maybe the number is a greater than the pivot, in which case, then we will assign it to j2. Uh, th this part, we're actually gonna be using the j pointer for that, so let me check if the number at j, starting from the right side, because the order that we process these elements and place them in the output is going to be important. So the number at j, if that's the case, then we uh, do this, and then we can decrement our j2 pointer. Now, either way, regardless of which of these executes, maybe both will execute, maybe only one will, maybe neither. Either way, we are always going to be shifting our i and our j pointer. So we can do this, i and j are gonna be i plus one and j minus one. So that's the first phase of the algorithm. The last phase is to actually get the pivot elements, however many there happen to be. Could do that many ways. You could do that like this, while i2 is less than or equal to uh, j2, we could do this, kind of like the two-pointer approach. Take the number for i2's position and j2's position and assign it to the pivot element. Then update both of the pointers like this, i2 
plus one, j two minus one. So I do believe that this will work. Let's give it a quick run. Yep, and as you can see here, it does work. And funny enough, even the memory efficiency is actually lower than the previous solution. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I can understand a little bit why the runtime would be lower. But anyways, if you found this helpful, check out Neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.